you were asked to graph the equation y equals 4 minus x squared by generating, in this case, uh, one point was given to you, one solution to that equation, 0, 4 was given to you, and then you plotted three other points and connected them with a smooth curve. So this should be what you have at your seats. Does anybody have anything different or have any questions about this at all before we move along today? So I'll be happy to go over anything about that. We all set with that? All right, I want to just point out a little thing, a couple of little things. Number one, when you represent an equation like this with two variables with a graph, you always should be connecting the points that you plot because this equation right here has how many solutions does that equation have? How many solutions does this equation y equals 4 minus x squared have? Infinite, right? An infinite number. We've only plotted here seven of the solutions. So this is a solution because when I put in negative 3 for x and negative 5 for y, the left and right sides are equal to each other. So that is what we call a solution to an equation when the left side equals the right side. So if you just look at that graph, whoops, how did that happen? Did I literally move it or something? That was funny. Huh. Let me go back to my pointer, get that back in position. All right. Every single possible point that that line goes through represents a solution to that equation. And as we've noticed, this graph continues to go on forever and ever and towards negative infinity. Okay. So um, the other thing I want to point out is notice how I put in, inputted the negative 3. Do you see how I put parentheses around it? the negative 3, because whenever you raise a negative number to an even power, it must be in parentheses. If I wrote this and wrote after it 9, that would be incorrect, because this says negative 1 times 3 squared. If I want to square a negative 3, I must put it in parentheses. These two things are not equivalent. And the reason I point that out is because We'll be using the quadratic formula very shortly. And as you know, in the quadratic formula, for those of you who have used it before, there's a term called b square. And when b is negative, I see a lot of students just write like dash 3 square. And then they write a 9. It's not right. So you've got to be careful. This is one of those little pieces of algebra you just got to sort of get uh, just straight in your head. That this first one. 3 is the base of the exponent 2. Here, negative 3 is the base of exponent 2. Okay. Yeah, Sonny? Okay, Paul? I saw the wrong hand, sorry. 2, 4. Oh, because I made a mistake. Thank you. That should be 2 what? Zero. Thank you. Yep. Little mistake. That's what happens when you go too fast. Right? I was just throwing it in there, trying to, because what was I thinking probably in my mind when I put the two in and got a four? Yeah, x squared. I was just thinking of y equals x squared. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? All right. So let's take a look at today's teaching demo. I'm going to take a capture, a quick, very quick picture of this graph and put it on the other page for us. Uh, make it a little bit smaller. Find the x and y intercepts of a graph. Now, this, if you have the actual graph itself, there's a particular place you look. If you have an equation, there's a way you can um, find it algebraically. And then I can show you from a table what it would look like as well. So this, again, I hope is like, you know, review for all of you. So basically, the x-intercepts of a graph is are the places, if there's more than one, uh, where the graph crosses your x-axis, or like hopefully on Sunday during the Super Bowl, 
where Malcolm Butler is going to intercept the pass from Matt Ryan, okay? So where the graph actually, the x-axis intercepts your graph. It gets in the way, and that's where it crosses. Same is true for y-intercepts. It's where the uh, graph crosses your y-axis. So literally, all we have to do uh, when we look at the graph is to say, hey, where is this thing crossing? What are the coordinates? I, I'll always ask you on projects and quizzes and tests for the coordinates of these. So you'll always be answering with an ordered pair, okay? So what are the coordinates for the x-intercepts? Someone want to help me out with that? Okay, go ahead. Sure, 2, 0, and negative 2, 0. And again, visually, that their spots are right there on the graph. So one of the things we want to do today is we want to see how we could use either GeoGebra or a graphing calculator to find those points. So that, that will be some of the things you might be having a chance to do today as you work through your activities. And what's the y-intercept here? 0, 4, right? And that occurs right here, 0, 4. All right. All right, so again, no problem if you have the graph. Sometimes it may not be an integer, like negative 2 and 2. It might fall somewhere in between, and the best you can do is to estimate it. Okay, so sometimes you might have to estimate an x or a y-intercept. Um, but if you have the equation, like we have here, you can always find the exact value of your intercepts by using algebra. So let's take a look at this. So to find the x-intercepts algebraically, you have an equation that has two variables in it. So in order to solve this for one of the variables, you have to be given a value for either x or y. So literally, when I think of x-intercepts, I just kind of close my eyes and I picture a point along the x-axis. And I say, hey, when I'm an x-intercept, my y value is 0. So the first thing I do is I set y equal to 0. And I have that equation to solve. Okay. Now this equation you can probably look at and solve, but not all of these equations you can look at and solve. So let's just talk about the method we would use to solve this equation. Or the methods, yeah, because you could use multiple methods here. What kind of equation is this again? I forgot. What's the name of this? I forgot to. It's a parabolic is the graph, the shape of the equation. The graph shape, yeah, is parabolic. What do we call this equation, though? L not linear. Why isn't it linear? What tells you it's not linear? Because you see that 2 or the square, right? So I heard another word out there. Quadratic, right? So this is a quadratic. quadratic equation. And remember, a quadratic equation is a special subset of the big type, the big category called polynomial equation. Okay, So this is a quadratic equation. You could also just say, hey, it's a polynomial equation. Right? Just like you're, you're all GCC students, but a, you're a subset of GCC students because you're in Math 107B. That's a sort of a more specific title for you right now. All right, now, I want you to go back to page, I believe it's nine in your packet. So scoop back to nine. And I want you to look right here, that statement. What you write down for your answer there? Always true, sometimes true, never true. Always true, and I agree with that. I put that in there for a very specific reason, and it has to do with solving quadratic equations. And I think you kind of look at that, and you, you don't think about it too much, and it kind of just disappears. You put the answer down, you check it in the back. You say, oh, good, I'm, I'm good to go. There's a lot going on there, really. Um, and we're going to take a look at that right now. So I want you to look at 
this equation for a minute, the 0 equals 4 minus x squared. And remember that there are two solutions to this equation. There are two places where that hits uh, the x-axis or crosses the x-axis. Okay? And let's take a look at this. I just need a little more room. So 0 equals 4 minus x squared. I'm just going to ask for people to volunteer how to solve this equation. The algebraic, you have to show all steps when you hand in your take-home quiz, not just put x equals plus or minus 2. OK, Cyrus? Yeah, uh, so you would add x squared to both sides. OK, I'll start with that. That's legitimate. You can add the same quantity to both sides of your equation. OK. Someone want to take it from there? And what does square root of 4 look like? Use the radical symbol, right? OK. So I'm going to put it on there, square root of x squared. And I'm going to put it oops, on here. So when you write this symbol, what square root are you asking for? Which square root is that asking for? Second power, but which, which, what's the sign when you do this? Square root of, if I do square root of nine, what, what's my answer? Three. But remember, to get that nine there, I could have had a three square, or I could have had a negative three squared. So what do I have to do so I get the answer negative three? Put a minus in front. So this is represents the negative square root. This represents the positive square root. Okay. When you see this simple symbol, it's only asking for the positive square root. It's called the principal square root. It's positive and negative if you do this out front. Yeah. Okay. All right, so when you told me, whoever told me I wasn't looking, to square root both sides, then what that means is when I put the answer for the square root of 4, it's only one answer, it's 2. And this next step, folks, is the one that no, probably no teacher prior to this class has ever asked you to do. Because what do I always see? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to erase it as fast as I see it. If I write this, I am incorrect. Because that x may be, I don't know whether that x is the positive 2 that got squared or the negative 2. You just told me a minute ago on page 9 that wherever you see Wherever you're, whenever you're asked to take the positive square root of this quantity called x squared, you must absolutely guarantee that the answer is positive. And the only way you can guarantee that is by putting those absolute value signs around it. So when you replace the square root, the principal square root of x squared with something that equals it, you have to put it in absolute value like this. You've never done this. I'm sure you've never done this. If you had, then you would look at that equation and you would say, hey, there's two numbers that can go in between these absolute value symbols. There's two numbers whose distance from zero is two units. That's what we call the absolute value, distance from zero. What two numbers could I put in here so the distance from 0 to each of those numbers would be 2 units. 2 and negative 2. So x can equal 2, and x could equal negative 2. Okay. Now, why sh I should save this whole speech for when we do quadratic equations. It will come up again, because I'll have to remind you. Why do I do this? Because it kills me, literally kills me, when I see this. So a student might get this far. And then they do this. So far, nothing, nothing wrong. And then I see this, and I say, oh, you've lost half credit for that problem because you only got one of the possible answers. 
So how do books get around it in other teachers? They don't, they get around it by not showing you this because this is a little more difficult to think about why this is equal to this. And unfortunately, by sort of taking the easy way out, you've lost a little bit of your abstract thinking. So here's how books get around it. They say, when you do this, you do the plus and minus square root of nine. You have to remember to put the plus and minus in there because this is the positive square. And it's still, I think, a little, a little fuzzy because I don't agree with that. But that's the way the books tell you to do it. So that's one way to do this problem. I want to show you another way real quick, a way that always guarantees you will never get the wrong, you will never forget both answers. That's to put everything on one side of the equation, or you could keep it like this and factor it. Square root of 4 is 2. X times X is X squared. You put a plus and a minus. So now you say, when does this equal 0? X plus 2 equals 0 when X is negative 2. When does that equal 0? When X is 2. So there's both answers, okay, negative 2 and 2. If you factor it into two factors and those factors are different, you have two different answers, okay? So, but most people don't like factoring. The other thing you could do is use a quadratic equation, but that's a lot of work for just a little baby problem like that. So the point here is that always be aware that you have two answers often, not always, because you could have a parabola that looks like this. You have a parabola that just comes down and touches the x-axis once. Then you only have, well, that's supposed to be touching, one answer. If you have a quadratic equation that looks like this, then you have no x-intercepts, OK? So you just want to always be aware of any kind of quadratic equation that has this form equals a constant. These are the ones that always kind of get you. You've got two answers here, always, when it equals a constant. Unless the constant's 0, then it's 0. All right. Undefined, it's never undefined. It could be a complex number okay. instead of a real number. Okay, but we'll wait to get a couple of classes to get to get. All right. So let's take a look at these graphing calculators and how they can help us do what we just did by hand. I'm going to just um, call up really quickly here um, my little TI-83. Some of you have an 84, and that's okay. They all work the same way here in terms of what we're about to do today. So, let me. so the first thing you want to do is I need to make this a little bit smaller for my purposes. Uh, so, nope. Control. Am I going to be able to make it smaller? Come on. We need, there we go. All right. So, hey, that's not working, right? I'm going to close this thing. See if I can get a better one up. Okay, let's try this again. Maybe I'll just put it to the side. Where is my little rabbit? There it is. Okay. Yeah, this yeah, this has been giving me problems this semester and I don't know why. Come on, two two arrows. Okay, I'll just keep it like that. I think, I think it will work all right. So if you want to graph an equation and you haven't used a graphing calculator before, there's a little button here called Y equals. So you just click that button button and it says, hey, give me an equation to graph. Now, one thing you want to make sure on your graphing calculators, as you see right above y1, it says plot 1, plot 2, plot 3. Make sure none of those plots are highlighted, or else you're going to have some problems. And I'll, and I'll help you in a minute if you do. Those should all be turned off. Those are stat plots, like scatter plots and bar graphs and things like that. So put in 4 minus x squared. So you hit 4, you hit the subtraction sign. You hit an X right here, X. And then you can either hit the square button over here, or you could use the little caret and say 2. I've got to move this up to get to the 2. 
And there we go, 4 minus x squared. Okay. All right, so we've done this first part. We've, we've, put, we've entered the equation. Now, you have to choose a window for this graph to appear. Now, for many of our applications, we're only interested a lot of times in the first quadrant of a graph, where all your x values are positive and all your y values are positive. So there are ways to, to tell the graphing calculator, hey, these are the values of x I want you to graph this equation for, and these are and then the output, you have to have a scale so that you can see the various values of y. And often that's the hardest part to think about ahead of time. But this is what we call a standard window. And the window uh, is always set up the same way. Okay, so let's take a look at that. The window is always set up the same exact way. It always has this format where the very first number you put into your window is the smallest value of x you want it to, to um, value for plotting, then the absolute largest value of x, and then, so in this case, it's negative 10 for x and positive 10 for x max, and then the one just says how you want to increment. You want to increase from one number to the other by adding one. You could have put 0.5 there and have it do every half, you could put 0.1, you could put any increment you want. The standard is 1. And then similarly for the y, y minimum negative 10, y max 10, and increment by 1. This is what we call the standard window. Now, you could have a graph that you could use the standard window for, and then you go to look at the graph and you don't see anything because your entire graph is way above um, a y, a y value of 10, so you wouldn't see it. So this is sometimes where you have to just play around a little bit. So let's take a look now at how you get the standard window. So right here, you see window, second button in, you hit that, and notice, I'm just showing you what we just saw in the notation, negative 10 to 10, increment by one, negative 10 to 10 for the y, increment by one. However, you can always get that window by hitting zoom six. That's the standard window. And the minute you hit it, out comes your graph. Voila. Okay. So if I gave you this graph on a test, I'm going to take a quick, quick picture of this. And I wrote this beside it. And I asked you to fill in the scale on the horizontal axis, the x-axis, and the vertical axis. This is how you would do it. You would say, this is the minimum value for my x. This is my maximum value for my x. And then as I move from left to right, I'm going to increment by 2. Okay. could just fill it in that way. So this is your change in x value. That little, that little triangle means change in its delta. Okay, this is your minimum y value. So you could come down here and say negative 10. This is your maximum y value. And then you know from looking at this scale right here that it's going to increment by 1. So if you wanted to put a couple of values in along the way, you could, just so you, anyone looking at this would know what your scale was. Okay. Is that clear how to use the window and the notation for the window? So one of the things I like to do on a quiz or a test is to give you a graph and give you the window and ask you to fill in some spots along each axis. So I, I make sure you know how to represent uh, the window for a particular graph or vice versa. Okay? All right. I'll get there in a minute. It means you're trying to input some data where you don't have equal numbers in the x and the y. Okay. 
All right, so now let's take a look at GeoGebra. Now, everybody should have a copy of that, don't get up right now, a copy of that green project, the GeoGebra reference sheet. Um, I am going to plead with you that this is due on Monday. And if you do nothing between now and Monday, you're going to be in that studio scrambling and getting very anxious. Uh, some people have already told me they've got it done, which was like shocking. Uh, three people in my first class had most of it done and actually came in with questions, which was great. What you should try to do between now and Friday is at least do the part of the project where you have to do the GeoGebra business. Don't worry about answering the questions. Those are like the X and Y intercepts and the modeling idea that we talked about on Monday. But try to have the GeoGebra part done and try to print it out so that if you have any questions, I can help you. And don't forget I have office hours uh, before class and today I'm in the studio at 1 o'clock and I have office hours at 2.30. So if you have any time today, if you're not rushing off to work or wherever you go after class, um, see if you can get going on this. It will be to your best in your best interest. Right? So let's take a look at how we would do the same thing on GeoGebra. So I've moved back because what's important is can everybody see this input bar down here? Is there anything in your way like my can of seltzer here or Anything in the way of you seeing this input bar? Now that input bar on some of the newer versions of GeoGebra is literally up here. So this is an, a little older version. All right, so anytime you want to put um, an equation into GeoGebra or input anything, you go to your input bar. Right now you have three views of GeoGebra. The algebra view over here where you get to see all of your equations and um, your points and stuff your graphical view and notice I don't have my spreadsheet on because I don't need it for today's class but you will be inputting the years in the what tuition and fees right for four-year public universities so to get your spreadsheet you go up to view and you say hey give me my spreadsheet and it appears on the right hand side so I'm just going to use this little X up here because I don't need it for today and anytime you want to move this around any, so this is like your window in a way, like see if you just want your your first quadrant, you can do that type of thing. And that's any kind of movement is done with those four arrows. If you want to do anything to your scale or your axes, you just literally grab it and scoot it up and down like that. Whee! Or double head arrow back and forth like this. Okay. Hi.